morning. Uh, again, my name is Rob Dietrich. I am here today to discuss uh, PEBT with you, the data pools, uh, and the process moving forward with it, as there have been a lot of questions surrounding that. Um, one thing I have not put necessarily in my slide presentation as we move forward, please remember that PET, PEBT is a joint effort between DPI, school nutrition, uh, home base, and then we are also working with DHHS uh, in order to try to make sure that these students are getting what they need. A quick agenda for today, we've got a welcome, uh, which I just did. We will go over the purpose, a PBT general overview, a data review, key points, a timeline, and there will be questions at the end. One thing that I will say with this webinar, and normally I don't do this, is I would ask that if you have your questions, please hold them till the end, because there, I believe that there is a lot of new information um, in this presentation that you've not seen before. Uh, I hope I'm correct in that, and that as we go through this, we may answer some of your questions. And if there are some that I think I don't have the answer to, that I will probably tell you that ahead of time. So if you could, just please hold your questions and then at the end, if you have them, we will be more than happy to give you time to answer them. Um, because I am sharing my screen and I'm only on one computer, um, I cannot see if John is Janet in the crowd with us today. Janet Johnson, is she here? Yes, it looks like she is. Good, and, and she may be able to answer some questions that I, I cannot, um, but we're going to try to give you a good um, explanation of how this process works over the next hour and thank you very much for uh, being here with us today. The purpose of this is to give a basic understanding of the data that is pulled and the amount calculation. Um, I am at the end of this going to give scenarios for uh, kind of how the calculation works, which I think will help people in understanding uh, variations in, in amounts of money that, that people are receiving. Here is a basic overview of PEBT. Uh, many of these, some of these slides, not many, some of these slides are taken from a school nutrition presentation that they did. And I felt that they were just kind of good to review with our folks in case you haven't seen them but the school participates in the national school lunch program the student is eligible for free or reduced price meals digital certification all those different categories the third thing is the student was closed or has been operating with a reduced attendance for at least five consecutive days and then what is the student's learning mode? And you see here, this is where there's a little bit of a shift. You see it says student is in a remote learning of 17 plus days of virtual instruction, they are eligible. They're in a hybrid learning mode, one to 16 days of virtual instruction, and student is in-person learning mode, zero days of virtual instruction, and they are ineligible. Um, I believe that one of the things that's very important that we discuss is what we have been talking about at DPI is remote learning and blended learning and in-session learning or on-site learning. So I felt like one of the first things I wanted to do is to give you an overview kind of, of oh, excuse me, I was ahead of myself. Uh, how much PEBT is determined is if it's one to 16 days of virtual instruction, they get the hybrid amount. And that hybrid amount is 6138. And if they are the remote amount, which means they were 17 or plus days of virtual instruction, they receive 11594. Um, and there you'd see how those numbers are determined is the average number of days they are using a hybrid schedule for that month. And on the remote, it is the average number of days there um, that are used. And this is where I was coming to before. I think it's very important to understand what the remote learning mode definition is, as well as the hybrid learning mode definition. Obviously, remote Learning is defined as all virtual instruction or learning that does not take place in the school. And the hybrid learning mode is defined as a combination of virtual 
and in-person instruction. I will come back to that as we get into the scenarios, as we go into some of the difficulties that you have when you have the, the blended instruction. The data pool that is being pulled, and actually one of the questions that I got the most was why are you pulling mother and father and not lives with? I have not actually gotten an answer to that. That is one I intend to get an answer to. And I will give you in writing once we uh, once I have that answer in place. We are pulling out of the basic demographics. We're pulling students, mother, father, mailing address. If there is no mailing address, they are pulling the actual address, the home phone, their entry date and exit date. One thing that I want to make very clear to people is the next data poll will be on March 10th. And that's extremely important. I'm going to say it now and I will reiterate it uh, towards the end. The data pool being on March 10th, if all of the issues that you have seen or as I discussed through this are corrected, the students will retroactively receive payment based on the corrected data. Again, on March 10th, when we pull the data, once it's sent over and processed, if the families are to receive a little more money based on the corrected data, they will receive that retroactively based on the corrections that you have made. So I hope that uh, everyone understands that the families will get what they should based on what the data says. We are pulling two additional points of data, and these are extremely important in this. We are pulling the school calendar type of in-session, blended instruction day, remote instruction day, and we are also pulling the attendance data. Uh, both of these become real important in the amount of money that a family may receive. So we're gonna spend just a little bit more time talking about these two pieces of data. The school calendar, type in session blended or instruction day. I've given you an example of each off of the calendar setup screen in PowerSchool is important because that tells us what is happening in that building. And again, with all the data, whether you're talking about the school type or the attendance data, we want an accurate reflection of what is happening in the school that day. Um, we, I don't want things set up or done kind of around to make this happen a certain way. What I want to see, as all of us do in that data, is here's what happened in my school building this day, and this is an accurate reflection of what was portrayed. So that is the school uh, calendar type. The second data that I wanted to go into a little bit more about is the attendance data. You have present on site, which for them equals live instruction, present off site equals remote and absences, which has been a large part of the discussion uh, that I have had with people as I walk through this are proportionally distributed. Uh, and again, attendance records must be accurate and need to be a reflection of what accurately occurred. Uh, if you're not sure about what we mean by proportionally distrib distributed or distribution with the absences, uh, I'm, we're going to explain that in a little more detail here. I also want to make sure that as we cover this and before we get into scenarios, that there are some key points uh, to reiterate. Please make sure your school calendars are accurate from the beginning of the year to present day. Please make sure that if you were remote, mark it remote. If you were blended, mark it blended. Um, one of the questions that I've been receiving a lot lately as kids start to transition back in, um, we're going to plan A, but we still have a percentage of our students that are gonna be doing remote learning. Well, in that case, you are uh, doing a blended learning environment because you still have a percentage of your kids that aren't setting foot in your campus. And for these purposes, they definitely need to be blended to make sure that they are processing them correctly. The attendance, I would recommend doing frequent, frequent audits on and make sure you follow the attendance guidance and that a present offsite is listed for remote instruction. Uh, and I just kind of put this in as just remember students can't be marked absent just because they couldn't log in. 
You're supposed to be also looking at the, the work that they do, because in the event that a student lost an internet connection, it's not their fault that they couldn't simply log into the system. That work should be presented to prove, hey, I was there. I was actually participating just in a different manner offsite. PEB timeline, uh, you see the benefits for August and December. Eligible students will receive their PEBT August to December in February. Um, PEBT January and February will be issued to those who are eligible. However, January and February benefits will be issued in March. So you have that. And then the benefits representative one month will be retroactively issued each month starting in April. So you see the graph there. Now, what I wanted to do at this point are give you a few scenarios and try to walk you through how some of this is processed because scenario one is fairly simple. So I'm not gonna to spend too much time talking about this. If your school calendar type is remote instruction day for the whole month and there are attendance records there, the remote benefit is 11594 for the students in that um, school. And that again, that's for the entire month. Scenario two, a blended instruction day equals a hybrid benefit of 6138, unless the student was 100% absent. But this is where it gets to be a little bit tricky. And this is where I wanna make sure that everybody kind of understands what's happening. Because now what happens is you look at that individual student record and what you're looking at that individual student record for is just because you're on a hybrid or a blended instruction day defined by hybrid here. That doesn't mean that every kid is hybrid you have obviously it's blended instruction, you could have a series of students that are in a blended instruction day as for the school goes, but that individual student has been receiving remote instruction the entire time and therefore they should receive the 100% amount. And I want to show you uh, kind of how that works in the following scenarios. Um, again, this is how a student would be in a blended learning environment. They have the remote instruction days and as long as that their remote instruction is greater than or equal to 17 days remote for that month, then they would actually receive the remote instruction amount of 115.94. Let me give you a breakdown of what this looks like. So let's say that a hybrid school or blended instruction day has 18 instructional days in the month. Student attendance for the month has 10 remote days, four live days, and four absences. The way that that works, and there have been so many questions around these absences that I wanted to kind of show you how that looks. You would have the calculation on the bottom. You have that takes the 10 remote days, puts the remote and live days together, and those made up 71%. You have the live days of four divided by the days put together, that's 29%. So if I take the four absences and because it's distributed proportionally, I multiply that by 71%, I get 2.8, that rounds to three, and I have four times 29%, that equals 1.1, that rounds to one. And therefore what happens is in this scenario, you have 10 remote days plus three absences equals 13 remote days you have four live days plus one absence, that equals five live days. So therefore the final count would be 13 remote days and five live days. As a result of that, this student would receive the school's hybrid rate of 6138 because the student record does not indicate fully remote. Um, it indicates less than 17 days. In this scenario, scenario four, another blended learning day breakdown. Now this one is key to look at because if you'll notice the number that I have been stating in order to kind of be the determination of whether benefits are 
for the entire month or not is the number of 17. And what you notice in this scenario is the number of days is actually reduced and it's under 17 days. In this month, this calendar, the hybrid school only has 11 instructional days in the month. And therefore, uh, you don't have 17. So what happens in this case? The student record for the month also shows four days remote and seven days absent. So in this case, what would happen is the student was present for four. There's 100% of, of the absences. There are zero days live. So therefore, there are zero calculated into the calculation. There are seven uh, times 100. That equals seven. So therefore, in this scenario, 11 remote days plus four absent days equals 15 remote days. And there is nothing included with the live days. So in this case, the, there are 15 remote days, zero live days. They would receive the fully virtual rate of 115.94 because the attendance record inside that blended instruction day calendar and that hybrid calendar shows that this student was 100% remote even though it is less than 17 days. Now, if we talk about the importance of attendance records, um, if you throw in a live day in here that is inaccurate, well, that shows that that student was present on site for one day, and therefore they would have been given the, the hybrid amount, um, and I, I believe around 65, so therefore, that's why it's so important to make sure that those days are, are accurate and correct in the attendance record, because here that attendance record is what drove everyone to understand that this student never set foot on campus during those days. And in the last scenario that I have is a hybrid school has 21 instructional days in a month and the student record for the month shows 15 days remote one day live and five days absent in this case you have over 17 instructional days so i wanted to give an example where that case occurs so in that case you see the breakdown of the calculating of the five absences i don't know that i need to go in as much detail as i have previously because uh, i know you guys can, can probably figure it out at this point. So with that, in this case, you have a scenario of five blended day breakdown and therefore you have 15 days remote plus five days absences equals 20 remote days. You have one live day and zero day absence equals one live day. In this case, you have 20 days remote, one live day. And in this case, the student would receive the full virtual rate because the student's attendance record indicates they were greater than or equal to 17 days remote in that scenario. Again, that key number is the 17 days remote. The takeaways that I wanted to give everybody from this is that the remote rate is 115.94. The hybrid rate is 61.38. The absences are adjusted proportionally to make sure that they are fairly distributed. The school calendar types are extremely important and the attendance records are important in making sure that the students receive the right amount uh, that they should receive. I encourage all of you, if you are communicating this out, if you are talking to your folks that are over these items, please stress to them the importance of, of what you've learned here today because an inaccurate record could, could de truly determine the amount of money that, that the family would receive. So we wanna make sure that those two items are correct. Obviously, I know we're always doing audits on demographic data and mailing address, make sure that's correct. I've been out there with you I know what that's like to try to get people to to make sure they've updated the information correctly and, and the parents are sharing that information with you. But please also remember that the school calendar types and the attendance records are very, very important to make sure that they are correct. And I also want to make sure and reiterate to you that the fixed records are retroactively paid so that as you do this, that you are telling your folks look at it one more time.
please make sure it's right so that when those adjustments come down, everything is where it belongs and where it needs to be. I also wanted to reiterate it this. I have already said it once here today, but I'll, I'll reiterate this kind of as I finish up. After March 10th, we are going to begin pulling the data on the 7th of every month. The idea behind pulling the data on the 7th is that gives you a week into the next month to fix the previous month. So we didn't want to pull the data on the first of the month because you want to give teachers and data managers time to fix that previous month's attendance before the next poll because we understand the fluidity that goes with the situation we're in right now with students some remote some in session um, and some it just we just need to make sure that we've got the most accurate data possible when we pull it so we wanted to give that extra week and by pulling it on the seventh we believe that that gives folks enough time to make sure that that last week of the previous month is correct and accurate before the data is pulled. Um, I, this is the last slide that I have. I am gonna ask uh, not to put Janet on the spot, but Janet, is there anything that I missed or I need to re-emphasize to people before we begin to take questions? Rob, I think you've done an excellent um, job of explaining a very complicated um, situation. The one thing that I would it will share is that we've also had these conversations with our school nutrition administrator. So you may be getting some questions from them as well. In Rob scenarios, um, it's very clear. I just want to remind you that there is a calculation that DHHS does if the student's record or attendance does not add up to the number of days of the school calendar, it's going to assume that those are live days, which then will factor right into the scenarios that Rob has shared with you. So if the student calendar says 20 days, but it only sees 15 days for a student, it's naturally going to assume that those additional five are live days and that could impact benefits as well. And, and Janet, thank you for that clarification. And let me reiterate a little bit about why um, that is the case. As many of you are aware, a present on site record is the default record in PowerSchool. And the default record in PowerSchool and the data comes across as a null record. So it, it's almost as though it's not there. So when they see those records in the attendance record, that is a present on site and therefore gets, gets converted into the remaining days. Um, and now is the time for questions. I, I want to go ahead and be upfront with you. I will answer what I can. Please understand that if I cannot answer the question, it's because I want to try to get you an answer to the question. Um, are there any questions out there, John, that we need to answer? Yes, so I have been pulling them aside as you've gone. Um, so I'll just kind of give them to you in the order they came in, if that works for you. Sure. All right. Um, let's see. The first one was actually a comment I thought was worth mentioning. It is important that individual schools who have to close for like two weeks due to a local exposure or something like that go in and change their day types, keep their calendar up to date. I thought that was a good point. That's a great point. Um, next one, we've been using blended instruction slash teacher workday for their one remote day each week. Will that pull correctly? Oh, I will find out. That is a good question. We will find out. I would assume yes, because it still says blended instruction day, but we will find out for sure. Perfect. Um, the next one. If we had just one student in the building, is that considered blended? Like maybe if you had one EC kid on site, but everyone else was remote, would you say blended or remote on the school calendar? Read it one more time. So if they had just one student in the building, maybe like a, a student that needed specific services in person, but every other kid in the building was remote, is that a blended learning day or a remote learning day? That is an excellent question. 
Um, I would like to take that one back and make sure that I have a solid answer for that. Because if I were to flip that, I would say that I would want them to say that it is like you, if you had everybody um, in session and you had a one student who was um, blended or remote at home, I would want to call that a blended environment to make sure that that is accurately recorded. I just want to make sure that that works the other way as well. Um, so I would just like to take a little time to put that, take that back and, and consider that and talk to some folks up here. Gotcha. Um, next up, um, so for clarity, for a student to be eligible for these payments, the school must participate in the National School Lunch Program. So like a charter school that self-funds their own free reduced lunch would not be eligible. Janet, do you know the answer to that? That is correct. In order to be eligible, you have to participate in the National School Lunch School Breakfast Program. There are charters that do not, um, and so only those that are um, approved for NSLP would be eligible. Thank you. Next up, um, what is the time frame for, for this data pull? So like when you're pulling the data on the 7th, are you looking at just the previous calendar month, the PMR reporting month every 20 days? Um, that is a good question. We are actually looking at calendar days. So it is pulling the previous, I believe what we're going to pull is the previous two months. So what you're looking at is on the 7th, we will pull the, previ the previous two months. All right. Um, the next one um, on scenario one, even if the calendar is remote, does the student still not have to have 17 remote days in attendance to receive the full benefit? The, the attendance record should still be an accurate reflection of what's there. But if they have the whole calendar as remote instruction, the amount will be given based on the calendar of that day in the remote instruction case. Janet, I think that's right, isn't it? That is correct. You just would not, a student that shows 100% absent, um, which is in your slide, would not be eligible. Okay, good. Thank you, Janet. All right, next question, John. Uh, the next one we got was, can this information be printed? Um, which I'm not sure if that's referring to the slide deck, which we will be sharing out. Um, or if we're we're talking about some sort of printed report for this information. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure either. Is that are they asking who asked the question? Are you asking for a printed report, or are you asking if this information can be printed? Yeah, that question was from Stanford Harrell. Um, so if you want to drop something in the the chat to clarify that, um, we will get you that answer, sir. Um, I I can. Uh, you answered it already, John, as, as you usually do, but we, we share this presentation with you. You can do with it what you what you need to. Perfect. Um, next up, someone was pointing out that or asking the hybrid rate is based on the daily rate times the state average. So isn't it true that the hybrid rate could be different moving forward? Um, 6138 is the hybrid rate for August through December, but um, that is actually not a question for anyone on this call to answer, but we can take that question to those who can answer it. Got it. And it looks like the next question was actually the same one. <laughs> um, let's see. So if a student is counted unexcused absent, they still get reimbursed for that day. Or they still get benefits from that day as long as they are not absent for the entire month that is my understanding that's why it's distributed proportionally across the month and i guess the best scenario for that i believe i my fourth scenario was um on 11 days and the student was absent a majority of those days and they still received the benefit because they were present at least one day in that month. Perfect. Um, and the next one, if a calendar day type is changed by a district, can that negatively impact a payment? Um, and I'm thinking we're probably talking about like 
if we change our calendar day type after the fact, after benefits have gone out, can that negatively impact people at that point? I don't know that I can answer that question on this call because that is a question not for this agency, but I believe we can take that back to the ones that can answer that question. Perfect. Um, next one, how are we pulling and calculating attendance for meeting attendance schools in cases where a student could be marked present off site in some periods and marked present on site in some other periods? Uh, that is a very good question. It's being based on on the daily account for that student. Right. Um, and then the last one I pulled aside and then I'll look at the ones that are coming in right now as we talk. Um, are parents aware of what we're doing at the school level and how it determines those benefits? I can't answer that question. I don't know that I am the one to answer that. Uh, but we can try to get that to the people who can. Perfect. All right, so that is it for what I pulled aside. Let's see what came in while we were talking about that. Um, da, 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 da. Oh, where is my spot? Okay, the first one I see here, what about community college classes where attendance is not generally taken? And I think I saw another similar one about online classes provided by third party vendors. Is it of utmost importance that they go in and put one R codes? Um, um, I, I here's, here's how I'm going to answer that. What we've tried to present to you today is that if there is not a one R code in there, it will look as though that student is present on site. And if they are considered present on site for that attendance, then that present on site will be seen as a hybrid and will convert that student to a hybrid amount. So ideally you would want one R's if that is truly what's happening in that room for that student. Perfect. Um, the next one is a clarification. Are we pulling this data from PowerSchool only for free and reduced lunch applicants? It's a good question, and I don't know the answer to that with enough confidence to answer it. But, John, if you'll record that down, we'll try to get an FAQ out next week from this webinar. Got you. Um, next one, how is the name on the actual card determined? Does it issue in the mother's name first? If a mother name isn't present, go to the father. I can't answer that. Janet, can you? I don't know that I can, um, and that may be another one of those if we can take it back to the um, to DHHS um, to see which field the card is being issued in. Perfect. And I do, um, think, I, I do think it's also worth noting while we're talking about cards, and I'm hoping I'm not speaking out of turn here, and Janet, please let me know if I am. The only, if they received a card Previously, they will not be receiving a new card. Benefits will be dropped into that card. The only people that will be receiving cards are those who had not previously received one. Is that an accurate statement, Janet? That is correct. And if their household receives benefits, um, food stamps, that dollar figure may be added to their existing card. But only those that are new will be receiving a card. All others will have them issued, the, the benefits issued on an existing card. All right. Next up was another day type question. They closed due to exposure. Should we record that as a remote instruction day or a remote instruction day state of emergency? Um, Actually, I think I can answer this one. The state of emergency type, I think, was reserved for like governor says emergency close everybody, right? Oh, correct. Perfect. Um, next one, we have a student at a school who was missed. And sorry, it scrolled away. All demographic information is correct, but they were missed during the first PEBT pool and missed again fall 2020. 
parent contacted DHHS and they're not on the list, um, do we have any tips about why that student must might be being missed? Uh, we do not have any tips as to why that student might be missed. Um, I would ask that you would do a ticket with ServiceNow uh, to let us know that that student was missed and the right people will look into that to see what's listed. Perfect. And, and John, I think I just saw one pop up about mothers and, and father and lives with. Please, I'm going to reiterate in case some of you came up late. That is the one question I did not get answers to. Um, I was really focused on the calculation and making sure that that piece was understood and getting that out. I will work to get answers to the mother, father, and the lives with, and what happens if one doesn't have custody, and all of those questions answered as, as quick as I can as we try to put an FAQ out based on this webinar. Um, the next one, another calendar day type thing. If we had should the calendar set be set to blended or remote for testing purposes? Students were in the building for testing, but otherwise were completely at home for instruction. So they maybe came in, took their test, went back home. That is a good question that I would like to answer to a little bit later. I want to make sure that I can get solid answers that we can. I don't want to say one thing here and then have to backtrack on it. So let me take that back and get an answer on that. Perfect. Sorry, this chat keeps scrolling away on me. Okay. <laughs> um, so we said next data pulls on 310, which will pull updated data and parents will receive corrected payments. Does that mean that the mother who has custody will get money that was previously sent to a father who was in prison? I can't answer that question. I we would have to look into that individual scenario. Perfect. So that might be a good ticket or follow up individually in email. Yeah, I agree. Uh, let's see. I think we answered this question. If the family already receives EBT. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, wait. So even if our school does not participate in the federal free reduced lunch program. We had heard that if the family already receives EBT, then this could increase their benefit. Is that not correct? I can't answer that question. I don't know if Janet can, but that sounds like another one we would need to take back to DHHS. And we can follow up with DHHS if I'm understanding correctly um, that the school the student attends does not participate in the national school lunch program. Therefore, they would not be eligible even if they are receiving other assistance through DHHS. That the key is enrolled in the national school lunch program. The next one. Um, so we said on the 7th of every month, we'll just be pulling the previous two months of data. What about the data pull on March 10th? Will that only be the previous two months or is that going to be everything? Um, I will get an answer to that question. I, I know for sure the previous two months, but I want to see if we'll, we'll be going farther back. All right, and then we got a question about if the present on-site column on the PMR will impact how data is pulled because on some PMRs that column isn't quite accurate even with the student records being double checked um, and I think that that correct me if I'm wrong we're still hammering out a few things with that present on-site percentage right we we are hammering out a few report. things and this is not looking at the PMR we're looking strictly at the school at the student attendance record perfect um, we answered both of those um, I see we had a question about the best way to contact us for additional questions around this. Um, should they email someone specific or put a ticket in or? Uh, I, that's a good question. I would say start with a ticket because I'd hate to give you an email address to email somebody and then not be the right one to get you the answer. The ticketing system will filter it to the right people that need to get an answer to because you may email me. And I may not be the right one to answer. You may email Janet. She might not be the right one to answer or John. And, and I'd like to get you the answers as quick as we can. And if we see the ticket, then we can at least try to get you the right answers. Perfect. Um, the 
this next one's kind of interesting. So they had a coordinator that reported errors in demographics in the school nutrition program caused an error in which parent received the PEBT card. In the future, if the demographics from school nutrition information, which may be different than power school demographics, will those be used for any determination of benefits? I cannot answer that, Janet. I don't know if you can answer that. Um, right off, I'm, I'm not sure if we can take that one as a follow up so that I completely okay. understand um, sure. the, the behind that because um, I'm hearing two different things, so I would much rather kind of mull over it and get back an answer that is correct and not have to retract. Yep, I, I agree. Absolutely. I should have put Janet's names on the slide, you all. My apologies. <laughs> um, next up, so if we have a student who has 10 consecutive unexcused absences, and of course they're dropped from ADM on the PMR and everything, but they're not withdrawn, will that student still receive at least the hybrid benefit amount? I do not know the answer to that, and I would have to take that back to the folks who do the calculation. That's a good question. All right, next up, um, someone who has realized that their calendar day type has been wrong since the beginning of the year. They marked in session, but they've actually been blended. Um, they did mark students with the 1R attendance code, though. So will those 1R attendance codes usurp the calendar day type um, for those few students who were remote more than 17 days? I would like to take that one back and we need to get if the person who asked that question, that is one I would like you to email me about because we need to get you a specific answer to that question and we will add that to our FAQ, John. Perfect. Um, as far as data pulls, we are pulling directly from PowerSchool into DPI, right? We're not pulling a file from child nutrition and then uploading by accountability. No, that's coming straight from PowerSchool. Perfect. Um, so I think this question is probably one we'll, we'll, we'll take back, but a student cared for by guardians that have custody, will the payment go to the guardians? The mother and father are not listed. Nope. We need to take that back. Um, and the next one was same thing, basically about, about living with and, and pulling that. Um, let's see, sorry, I lost my spot again. No worries. We have students, high school students taking CCP courses all online. Should they be marked with 1R? Um, they're always marked present. Um, and I think I can take that one and say yes. If they are attending online remotely, it would be a 1R. If they are physically in your school building, it would be a present on site. Um, if a parent has lost or discarded their PEBT card, how can they get a new one? Rob, I think I can take that one. They can contact the DHHS um, call center and ask for a replacement card. And I will see if I can find that number on another document and get back with you or put it in the chat or provide that to um, Rob so that that can be included. Um, yep. Yeah, we'll to put go it along with this. Yeah. We'll put it in the FAQ, ma'am. Perfect. Um, Another another statement comment about about the mother father pool. They have fathers with full custody receiving cards with the mom's name, regardless of living with. So we definitely need to to look at that. Um, we answered that already. We'll pull that one aside. We've got a couple different scenarios about mother or father contacts live with being wrong. So we'll pull those aside and and make sure that we review those all internally. Um, do CEP schools receive these benefits regardless of attendance and calendar type? Rob, I'll take a stab at that one. Um, even, even though they're enrolled in a CEP school, attendance and school calendars are what's going to determine the amount of benefits they'll receive, if any. So um, those school calendars and student attendance is going to determine their eligibility just as other schools. And I think Rob has covered that in his presentation. So um, those school calendars and student attendance records are critical for any school. 
Perfect. Um, the next one up I think is pretty good. What should we do for an address on a homeless family that would be eligible? Rob, we may want to take that one um, separate as well to see if what the recommendation is from our partners to see if that could go to um, a local um, contact and the, the household could pick it up from that individual. Yeah, we'll, we'll take that one back. Perfect. Uh, the next one is age range of students included in these benefits, which I believe is all K-12, right? It's those students that are enrolled, and that could be some pre-K students. Um, so if they're enrolled in your school district, in a school, then that would determine eligibility. Um, and there is legislation out there for um, these benefits for those under five. Um, they're working on that as well. But it, it is students that are enrolled in your school district. Perfect. Um, we got another one about the the retroactive payments. So the March 10th data pull is going to be January, February, and retroactive payments for August through December. Correct. Um, but future data pulls are just for the previous two months. Um, and I think that that's the same one we got to take back later. Yep. That's the, and I understand that time is of the essence. So I'm going to try my best to get answers to these questions at the latest by the end of the day, Monday, if not sooner. Perfect. Um, let's see. Next one present off site versus present on site for community college would only apply if the class is scheduled during the school day. Correct. If it's scheduled during the school day, yes, everything during the school day should be accurate and correct. Right, we're all almost to the end here. Um, parents that are complaining their students' data is not reported to DHHS. What can we do? I think, I think that's probably something we'll have to take back. Uh, say that. Unless you guys have any time tips? Time. Yeah, say that. Um, one more any tips for what schools can do with parents who are complaining that student data is not being reported to DHHS? Um, I think my answer to that would be individually look at the first to look at the data that's in there for those students to determine if the amount that they received is correct based on what we have told you today, and then to determine next steps with the with the family. But the first thing you should always do is verify to see if if, if maybe you can't figure out what happened. Perfect. Um, so it looks like I've got two more in the chat. Um, and we can look at the Q&A then if we have time too. Um, DPI has always told us in the past to enter mother and father as they are on the birth certificate, regardless of custody. Has that changed? No, that is correct. Right. And then this one I like. If a student came from another school at the beginning of the month, will the student still get the f full amount? So, you know, maybe if half a kid's record is over here and the other half is over there for a given month, are we putting that together? I guess is the question. That is a great question. And I don't know that I have heard that come up in all my conversations. So I think that is one we would have to take back. Um, and then we've got last one in the chat so far is what do we do if the DHHS call center says a student isn't in the system, but the student's been enrolled with them since day one? Um, and I think I would double check their data and then maybe do a ticket with us to see. Yep, and, and let us kind of review that. Um, let's see, do we know what time on March 10th that we're doing this pull? Is it like we, late evening or early we, morning? We tend to do these late evening. We want to give you the day to, to get it done. Okay. So they could safely say close the business 5 p.m. on the 10th is there. On, is is there. Yeah, I would agree with that. All right. Um, will changes to attendance records cause errors in PMRs? If you're changing from present to absent, I, I mean, potentially it could. Yeah. Um, what category should they select in service now for these types of issues? Good question. I would say 
I would say general because it could go to either the the home base side or the school nutrition side. Gotcha. And we we can clarify that one a little bit um, and get something back out. Um, is it possible for PSUs to get a list of what was sent over to DHHS just to help with future cleanup, or is that too terribly confidential? Uh, we would have to take that back, but essentially what was sent should be a reflection of your data on the day that we pull it. So essentially you should be able to take a snapshot on March 10th of what you have, and then that should be what what is received. Perfect. All right. And I know we're running up on time here, so I'm going to try to try to pick out things. Um, let's see, we answered that. that. Water, while you're looking, I'm going to just say a, a few closing things. Um, I hope uh, that you are more informed after this webinar than you were before this webinar. Um, I know there are still questions we have to go back and see. What I will be doing is going through those questions to determine what do I need to answer right now and what do I have a little bit of time on because I know some of these are before March 10th and some some we have a little bit of leeway on. Um, so we'll, I'll be spending some time doing that uh, and trying to get you the answers needed right away as quickly as possible and then try to get you the answers for the other questions as well. Um, I know we couldn't answer all your questions. It is a complicated um, topic, I think, with all the parties involved, but I, I hope we answered as many of your questions as we could here and that you, again, feel a little more informed after this. Perfect. I think I see maybe two more that are that are probably worth worth hammering on one more time, and we will go through these um, afterward and, and make sure we get answers for anything we didn't cover otherwise. Um, the first one I saw was, does this apply to charter schools? And I think that answer is yes, if they're participating in the National School Lunch Program. Um, and then we had one, which I, I think is good to point out. So we're going into a scenario where we're face-to-face -face Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, Friday, but we're remote on Wednesday. So would we continue marking the calendar in session Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday? and remote Wednesday, or would they mark blended? And I, I, I think that answer is whatever's happening on that day in that school. So if everyone's on site on Monday in that school, it's in session. If everyone's remote Wednesday in that school, it's remote. If half or this and half or that on that day in that school, then it's blended. Great answer. Let's see, and I think Unless there are any any last minute, what about this sort of things? I think a lot of these others I haven't read out specifically. We've at least spoken to, um, and again, we'll we'll run back through these um, and and make sure that we have answered everything. Um, and yes, Francine, I see just put in students in our district have had the option to be virtual, so we've put blended for every day. That sounds correct to me. Me too. So I hope hopefully that answers it all. Um, and like I said, we will certainly go through all of these and get those answers we didn't have um, and put together an FAQ and we'll get the slide deck out to you and we will get the recording of this webinar right here as well. I want to thank everyone for attending and Janet, I want to thank you for being here and, and kind of answering some questions we couldn't. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, every, everybody else, uh, I hope you have a great Friday and look forward to seeing you soon. And John, thank you very much for emceeing. Absolutely. Thank you all.